Well, 2020 was a, a roller coaster year for all of us. I, I think we can agree on that. Pastor Hannah and I, at the start of the year, we had a lot that we were looking forward to in 2020, both in our, our home lives and in our ministry life. In our home life, we were expecting our second born, uh, Junia, to come in February. Henry was about to celebrate his second birthday, and we had a trip planned to go to California. It was going to be a good year. On the ministry end, things were going really well, too. I mean, we're our uh, young adults group that we had started off with, with five semi-committed young adults had grown to over 50 at the church we were at. We were seeing our, our youth group grow and reach people who didn't know Jesus. And our church had just purchased this massive indoor play park that we were going to use during the cold winter months in Canada to reach the community, to provide a, a safe space for families to come out and uh, get used to, to being in church and, and see that they're a community, uh, we were a community for them. But then the pandemic hit, and all of those plans began to unravel. We, we tried making plans, especially for birthday parties with our kids and having people up, but there was no telling when the border would open or close. We tried making plans for when we would go to California, but there was no telling how things were going to play out. And, and we tried to make plans for when we would come back to in-person services, but we just... Anytime we would make a decision, uh, another thing would change. It was so unpredictable. It was so hard to know how we were going to get out of this season of lockdown. And you know, you had different people speculating on the lockdown. You had some people saying, it's just going to be two weeks, so go buy all the extra toilet paper that you need to load up. Some of you are laughing, but some of you were those ones that bought all the toilet paper so that I didn't have any toilet paper those two weeks. <laughs> So some people said it was just two weeks, just load up on the essentials and we'll get through it. Some people said it'd be a few months. Some people said it would be a year. And we all knew where we wanted to be. We wanted to get to that, that promised land that was no more lockdown. But we had no idea when we'd get there. I don't know if you're anything like me, but I felt stuck in my circumstances. We're in a, a series this week and over the next few weeks called God With Us, where we're looking at this truth that God is with us in every season of life. We talked last week about how God is with us on the mountaintops of our faith and in the valleys of faith. The, the valleys of faith are those moments where we experience loss and heartache and, and grief and we feel alone. God is with us in the valley. And at the same time, we're going to be looking at this week that not only is God with us in the mountaintops and the valleys, but God is also with us in the wilderness. The wilderness is, is this biblical concept that gets brought up a lot throughout Scripture. And uh, I'll, I'll rely on Pastor Craig Rochelle to give us a, a good definition. He says, The wilderness is a barren, dry, or desolate place where you feel very alone, where you feel stuck, where you feel lost. Or maybe you have an idea of where you're supposed to be, you're just not sure how to get there. And when I look at that lockdown period for my family and I, it was really a season of wilderness. We knew where we wanted to be, we just had no idea how we could get there. Some of you today walked in and you're in a season of wilderness yourself. Maybe it's related to your job and you've got a, a boss that you're not fond of or coworkers that you don't enjoy working with, and you have this idea of another career you're going to work towards, but leaving this job would mean insecurity, and maybe, maybe you'd have to take out another college loan to go back to school, and it's like, I know where I want to be, I just, I don't know the decisions I should make to get there. It feels like you're just wandering around in the wilderness. Some of you here today, maybe you're renting, and you're, you're thinking, man, I'd love to own a home. I'm going to move towards this process of owning a home, but in this unpredictable, ever-inflating market, I don't know what the right decisions are to get there. You feel like you're wandering in the wilderness. You know where you want to be. You just don't know how to get there. And some of you today came in, and you're in a wilderness of faith. And it's like you want to have a close relationship with God. You want to grow deeper in a sense of your calling over your life and understand where God is leading you, but you're not quite sure how to get there. What's really interesting about these wilderness seasons, at least throughout Scripture, is what I found. 
is that the mountaintop experiences of faith are usually followed by a season of wilderness. Those moments where you really encounter God, where you hear his voice and he's speaking to you, are often followed by a wilderness season. You can look at a a few examples. You know, Jesus, when he's baptized, goes into the water. He hears the voice of God audibly saying, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And then immediately he goes to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, we We could talk about the Israelites themselves. The Israelites, they saw God part the Red Sea and they walked across on dry ground. They saw God deliver them in a mighty way and then they find themselves in the wilderness for 40 years. We're going to be looking at maybe a a lesser known story of the mountaintop experience in the wilderness experience. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 18 and it's, uh, it's surrounding Elijah the prophet. So you can open your Bibles if you have them or they'll be on the screen to 1 Kings chapter 18. And like these, these wilderness um, examples we've talked about, this story starts off on a literal mountaintop. Starts off on the top of Mount Carmel. And we should, we should give a little bit of clarity and context to what's happening here because anytime we read the Bible, we don't want to really read it through our 21st century eyes because we can impose our own culture, our own beliefs on Scripture. We want to, we want to try to step, uh, take a step back and put ourselves in the shoes of the people that were in this story so we can understand the true message behind the text. Elijah was a prophet, one of the most well-known, and really his primary role as a prophet was to bring the Word of God to the people of God. And he did this at a time when uh, the majority of people were completely illiterate, They couldn't read. There was also no printing press, so even if they could read, it's not like they could pull out their Bible or their Torah and catch up on Scripture. It was Elijah's job to bring the Word of God to the people of God. He also did this at a time when Israel was establishing itself as a nation, and they were surrounded by all these other nations with different cultural and religious beliefs, and any time they would begin to steer away from their worship of the one true God, It was the prophet's job to help kind of course correct them, to keep them on track, and to remind them of their faith, the God who delivered them. During this time period, Israel is led by the wicked king Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And it's not so much that Ahab has led the people away from serving Yahweh, the one true God. They they still have this belief in God, but at the same time, it's become this pluralistic belief. They've begun adopting beliefs in other gods from other nations. So on the one hand, they they believe in Yahweh, they believe in the one true God, and on the other hand, they have this belief in this religious practice involving the god called Baal and Asherah. You don't need to know much about these gods except that oftentimes in history they're kind of interchangeable. Baal can be the the male version of Asherah and Asherah the, the female version of Baal. But they had a few values as far as their their religion went that showed up regularly throughout history. One of those was self-harm. The other was sexual deviancy. So when it came to Baal and Asherah, the way you worshipped, one, was through self-harm, and two, through sexual deviancy. In fact, the, the temples of Baal that would be set up throughout the country, they had this belief that in engaging with temple prostitution, That was the way you prayed to the god Baal. It was the way you could request that um, Baal would answer your prayers. And you can imagine, this started to really erode society. I mean, the the family unit started to disintegrate in Israel. There was was adultery regularly. There was fornication. I mean, this was a, a, a founding value of this new religion, and so it was encouraged. And finally, Elijah, who uh, has just about had it with these prophets pushing this religion, meets King Ahab on Mount Carmel. We're in 1 Kings chapter 18, starting with uh, verse 17. And this is what happens. When King Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, So it is really you, troublemaker of Israel. I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. 
Now summon all Israel to come join me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who are supported by Jezebel, Jezebel being Ahab's wife. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. And then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people remained completely silent. They have no answer for this challenge. So then Elijah, he challenges them to really prove the validity of this God that they serve. They both set up altars. Um, one, the, the prophets of Baal set up one, and Elijah sets up one. And Elijah issues this challenge to the prophets. He says, call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God, and all of the people agreed. Now, we're, we're covering a lot of ground in Scripture today, so I'd encourage you to go back this week and, and read these passages, but I want to give you kind of a, a summary of what happens from this point on. The, the prophets start worshiping Baal and Asherah, and it goes on all morning. They're not receiving any response, and it divulges into them beginning to cut themselves and injure themselves. And still, they're bleeding. Their God is not answering any of their prayers. Elijah, meanwhile, is kind of sitting back with his feet up, mocking them a little bit, talking a little bit of smack. And finally, they tire out, and Elijah gets up, and he asks the servants to jump, dump four jars of water over the wood three times. This way, there's no possible way this wood could ignite. So they, they light the, or they, they, they dump all the water over the wood, and then Elijah prays one prayer, and fire from heaven comes down and lights the altar ablaze. And everyone can see there is only one true God, the God of Israel, Yahweh. And this results in the prophets of Baal and Asherah being killed. They're wiped off the face of the earth in that moment, over 850 of them. And I can imagine that for Elijah, this was really a mountaintop experience of faith. I mean, here's Elijah. He's been trying to deliver the word of God to the people of God. He's been trying to course correct them to, to follow the one true God, and they've lost their way. And, and finally, God responds on this mountaintop by completely eliminating this religion in their country. He must have thought, finally, all this self-harm is going to stop. Finally, families are going to come back together. Finally, the one true God of Israel will be worshipped. King Ahab returns home and shares this, all the happenings with his wife, Jezebel. And, it, and this is Jezebel's response in chapter 19, verse 2. Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. It's like Elijah is on this mountaintop experience of faith. He has so much hope for the future of Israel, and then the queen herself says that he's going to be gone the next day. She's going to do whatever it takes to kill him. And when we look at the, when we kind of map out the distance that Elijah traveled into the wilderness after this, we can roughly say that he traveled close to 100 miles that day, running far away into the wilderness. I mean, he just kept running like Forrest Gump. He just kept going and going, and, and by this point, when he gets under the broom tree, he's exhausted. He's so tired, and it's like, it's not even like tired like I need to take a nap. It's like depleted, like he's got nothing left. He's, he's had enough. And can't we all relate to that feeling a little bit? Like, man, I've just had enough. You and I, we're, we're strong. We can push through difficult seasons of life. We can push through those sleepless nights with the kids. We can push through that, that hard work environment that we don't really enjoy, but we can, we can soldier on. 
Then it's like that one thing happens and it pushes you over the edge. You get that phone call. There's that health crisis, the loss of a loved one. It's like you've had enough. You're just so depleted and, and so tired. Elijah is completely exhausted. He's had enough. But it's amazing to me what God's response is in the middle of that despair. Out in the wilderness when he just has nothing left to give, when he's so exhausted. Notice what we're about to read. God's response isn't, Elijah, just pick yourself up. You need to keep moving. Soldier on. Push through the pain. You got this. There's not a a theological argument that God gives him. No, while Elijah is sleeping... The angel wakes him up and says, get up and eat. Get up and eat. Verse 6 says, he looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. In the middle of your despair, when you're at your wit's end, when it feels like you've had enough, God is with us. He meets us at the brink of our exhaustion and he provides for us. He gives us exactly what we need when we need it. Verse seven, then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. And he feeds him again. You know, we we live in this unbelievably fast-paced culture where we're excessively busy We've got another activity to run to right after this church service. We've, we've got extra hours to work. We, we have activities for our kids, that family event, that church event. We, we've got everything on our plate, and we're excessively busy. And maybe you're like me, and during COVID, it kind of slowed down a little bit, but then it came back with a vengeance. Like when things opened up, you got even busier than you ever were before. We're excessively busy. Don't ask me, or or don't believe me, just ask your neighbor. Go home, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, how are you today? And look at how many people say, oh, I'm so busy. Or, oh, I'm so tired. We are excessively busy in our Western culture. And and at the same time, we're bombarded by all this information from these supercomputers in our pocket, you know, social media posts and news about tragedy happening around the world. We're just excessively busy, and there's so much noise competing for our attention at any given point. And you know, when it comes to this sermon, I'm always preaching to myself, but like today, I'm really preaching to myself. Because I know in my own life, I'm excessively busy. There's always another phone call to make. There's always another hospital that I could go visit. There's always another event that I could launch in the name of reaching people for Jesus. See, you can be doing amazing things for the kingdom of God and still find yourself depleted and exhausted. You can still go at at the speed of 100 miles an hour serving people and still be completely depleted. And I just wonder for Elijah if this was the case with him. You know, he's, he's just challenged the king of Israel. He's stood down 850 prophets. We haven't even read the other 17 chapters that come before this in 1 Kings, where he travels around the country declaring the word of God, where he raises a boy back to life. I mean, Elijah is just moving, and at the end of this, he, he travels over 100 miles. Like, this man is hustling. But despite all of the good he's done, he's completely exhausted and depleted. I read a quote this week from Dallas Willard, and he said this, that hurry is the enemy of our souls. Hurry is the enemy of our souls. Now, you may think that's kind of odd for a theologian to say. Like, wouldn't a theologian say something like, the enemy is the enemy of our souls? The enemy's lies, um, pagan culture is an enemy of our souls? No, he says, hurry is the enemy of our souls. See, for so many of us, we're so busy We're running from one thing to the next. And we get so consumed with what we're doing that we miss the only thing, the one thing that can truly give us rest in life, an intimate relationship with God. You can do great things for the kingdom of God in church, in your community, but so many of us, we miss that personal one-on-one relationship 
with God because we're just too busy. Jesus said it like this in Matthew. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Some of you need to hear this today. The most spiritual thing that you can do this week is rest. Take a step back. Be with God. Before opening up your phone in the morning, before going on to that appointment or whatever you have, stop and rest and and just have that personal relationship with God. You know, if we were created by God to serve God, why would we think that we could get any fulfillment or rest anywhere else but with God? I wonder if this was part of Elijah's story at this point. You know, he's just been going and going and going. And in verse 8, he eats and says he got up, ate, and drank, and the food gave him enough strength. He's still got a journey ahead of him, and he travels 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And there he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Just a note on this, Elijah is not the only prophet left, but in his exhaustion and depletion, he can't think clearly. He feels so alone and burdened. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. And he hears the audible voice of God in the form of, of a whisper. Why does God choose to speak in a whisper? I mean, not just to Elijah, but to us too. You know, like if, if God really wanted to get our attention, wouldn't he speak really loudly? Wouldn't he shout at the mountaintops? Why, why is he so gentle? Why is his voice so still and small? Why doesn't he speak in loud and spectacular ways like the earth, wind, and fire? That was a 1970s reference for someone here today. If he wants us to know him and hear him, why does he whisper? I I love how Pastor Craig Rochelle says it. He says, I'll tell you why he whispers. God whispers because he's close. I've shared a lot in my sermons recently, illustrations about my kid's not sleeping. So I have one more illustration to share, and then I promise I'll give it a rest for future sermons. It's just very real to me right now. When we were sleep training Henry, uh, when he was about one years old, we did all these methods, but we found one that was really interesting. You would um, you'd go in, take him in, in his bedroom, lay him down in his crib, and you'd just rub his back and sing to him and talk to him, and slowly you'd stop talking and after about five minutes, you'd sit down in the chair next to him, or you could still reach him, and you could still touch him, and you could still pat his back. And of course, every time you transition to the chair, Henry would look up, and he'd be really upset. I'd just tell him, Henry, I'm right here beside you. It's okay, I didn't go anywhere. And then finally, you would take a step out of the chair and towards the door, where you couldn't actually touch Henry, where he couldn't actually feel you, couldn't actually even really sense your presence there. And you just whisper every time he got upset, Henry, I'm right here with you. I'm right here. Henry would cry so loud that sometimes he couldn't even hear my voice. But that's the trick. You just have to keep whispering, Henry, I'm right here. I'm right beside you. I didn't go anywhere. And some of you here today, you're, you're wondering, why, isn't, why can't I feel God? Why can't I hear God? And it's like, maybe if we just slowed down, quieted the noise, we'd see that God has never left us. 
He's right there beside us. He is truly Emmanuel, God with us, which means he's there with us on the mountaintops of faith. He's there with us in the valley. He's there in the wilderness. He doesn't leave our side. What would happen if just this week you really slowed down each day? Before opening your phone, before going on to work, you created that space to listen for the voice of God. Really, really created that quiet in your life to hear what God has to say to you. How would that change your life? The team's going to come forward. Um, you know, as I was preparing the sermon, I was really stuck on the conclusion part of this and how I was going to land the proverbial plane, so to speak. And um, I, I'm very rigid and maybe a bit OCD when it comes to prepping sermons. You can just ask Hannah, as is she, because we both feel it's a big responsibility to talk about God and to deliver the word of God to the people of God. And um, so I have this weird thing, and you're going to think I'm OCD and it's just weird of me to do, but I, I have this special number where if I, can, if I can practice my sermon before Sunday seven times, before preaching, then I feel like I really got it. So every week I'm like preaching to a wall in our basement. And um, seven is kind of that number where it feels like the sermon, that's all head knowledge, becomes heart knowledge too. Like it becomes ingrained in me and I can, I can speak and, I'll, and also have room for God to speak through me. And just as I was preparing this sermon, I, I just felt like I'm not doing what I'm preaching. Like, I, I'm, I'm telling people, you got to slow down, you got to stop with the busyness and hear the voice of God, and here I am talking to a wall for another hour. And so I, I, uh, I cut it down from seven times to five, I know. For me, that was big. But rather than doing those other two times, I just slowed down and I listened to God. I just spent some time reading scripture and I came across this verse in Ephesians chapter 3, starting with 17. It says, And I pray, pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. See, if we really want to be filled up, if we feel like we're running on empty and we're just depleted and we want to be filled up, we have to, as the text say, we have to root ourselves in the love of God. And rooting ourselves in the love of God, this, I don't know if you know this, a tree doesn't root itself in the ground in one night. It takes days and weeks and months for those roots to go deep so it can stand up to the storms that it may face. We are called to root ourselves in the love of Christ so that we can be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. And so I want to challenge you to do that this week. Slow down. Listen for the voice of God and root yourself day after day in that unchanging, never-ending love that God offers us. As the team leads us here, I want to open up the, uh, the kneelers here if you just need some time to um, take a physical posture of needing to pray and, and hear from God. These are open, and we'd love to pray over you if you want to come forward. But just as we sing this song about God's love for us, let, let's just take some time to listen, to hear what God would have to say to us, and to watch as he speaks in that whisper how that could change us and transform us from the inside out. Let's worship through song.